Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 from the New King James Version. And here's what the Apostle Paul said. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Paul, of course, Paul is saying that he is the one or the primary one that led so many of these Corinthians to the Lord. And by leading them to accept Jesus, to make Jesus the Lord of their lives, he betrothed them. We would say engaged. They're engaged to be married. He said, I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So here's the picture. You know, when we get to heaven, there's going to be something in the next age. After the second coming, there's going to be something called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Of course, Jesus is the Lamb, but it's the marriage supper. And this is when the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the believers in Jesus here on the earth and who have already passed on, they'll be actually officially married and become one with the Lord. Somebody said, well, I thought we we're already one. Well, we are spiritually but our bodies, see, haven't been saved. They haven't been uh, transformed, as 1 Corinthians 15 told us, into immortal bodies, into incorruptible bodies. And so we still have uh, salvation now spiritually, but there is a part of us that's not saved. So the full salvation is going to take place at the end of the age. And we're not only going to be one with the Lord spiritually, but we're going to be one together with him. Right now, he's seated at the right hand of God, the Father, and we're down here on earth, at least those of us who are alive and remain. And yet, uh, we're all going to be together at this marriage supper. It's going to be a glorious thing. I, I love in Revelation 19, where this person uh, who is leading John through this vision, he says, write this down. Blessed are those who have been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You're so blessed if you've been invited to be married to this precious Son of God who loves us so much, and you miss hell in the process, by the way. He said, you're so blessed. Well, Paul said, listen, I betrothed all of you, he's saying, to one husband, to Jesus, to Jesus Christ. And he said that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Notice, I've already betrothed you. You accepted Jesus' proposal. The gospel was the proposal. You're making him Lord was the acceptance of that in, uh, proposal for marriage. But Paul said, but the presentation at the marriage supper of the Lamb as a chaste virgin is yet to come. And so Paul said, I'm working on you. I'm teaching you the word of God. I'm teaching you to prepare yourself, to prepare your life, that you may be ready, that you may be like a bride on her wedding day. I mean, everything is pristine, perfect, thought through. Uh, she's got her hair done. She's got her nails done. She's got her dress just right. Everything is just the way that she had planned for it to be. Paul said, We've been saved, we've been born again in the Spirit, but our lives are not up to the place where we're ready to marry the Lord. But he said, this is what I'm doing. I'm teaching you the Word of God. I'm teaching you to walk in obedience. And those righteous acts, the Bible says, are the, the clothing that we'll be clothed with when we come and are presented to the Lord. So somebody said, well, I, I'm not a chaste virgin. I've had a a very horrible, sinful past. Well, yeah, but thank God, God cleans you up. He forgives you, washes you by the blood of Jesus. And then with the word of God, the washing of the water of the word, he washes up your life. He cleans up the way that you live. 
See, so you're, you're washed from your sins by the blood of Jesus, but you're washed from the way that you live that is uh, not in alignment with God, not obedient to the Lord, not pleasing to the Lord. You're washed from those things by the word of God. And so Paul said, I've already betrothed you. You're already engaged because you've received the gospel and accepted the proposal of Christ. But now I'm preparing you for the wedding day when I present you because of your righteousness, because you're walking in obedience. I'm presenting you as a chaste virgin to Christ. What a beautiful picture. And notice that Paul believes that he will not just be a spectator when all this is happening, but that because of his role in leading them to the Lord and, and discipling them, that he'll be able to present them. We would think, well, that's just Paul's opinion if it wasn't in Scripture and inspired by the Holy Spirit. So there's going to be more participation for we who are leading others, and that wouldn't just be pastors and apostles. This would be anyone who leads and disciples other people. There's going to be more participation here than we think when we come to the Lord and when we're united together with Him at the end of the age. And so notice here now, it says in verse 3, But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. So Paul's saying, I'm concerned. He said, I fear. He said, I'm concerned that just as Eve was deceived, Back in the Garden of Eden, he said, I'm concerned that other people would come and they would preach something similar, but it wouldn't quite be the same Jesus that we preach. They would preach a gospel, but it would have things in it that are not part of the original true gospel that Paul preached. And so he said, I'm concerned that you won't catch those heresies, those flaws, and that you'll actually accept them and put up with them. Verse 5, for I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostle. Now you're going to see not pride, but you're going to see confidence from Paul and him saying, look, there are other apostles that may have even walked with Jesus, been part of the 12. He said, but I don't count myself at all inferior to the most eminent, the most esteemed. Of course, that would be Peter and James, the brother of the Lord, and of course, John. And uh, those apostles, those kinds of apostles that are very highly known and respected for their proximity to Jesus or their leadership in the church, etc. And so he says, I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I am untrained in speech. He said, I haven't been trained in oration, in speech, in giving speeches. He said, I haven't been trained in speech, yet I am not untrained in knowledge. Though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. He goes on to say, but we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Now, of course, you know, Paul was a Pharisee, and he even said he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. In other words, very studious. So he knew the Bible. Of course, at that point, the Bible was what we consider today the Old Testament. But that was the only Bible that they had and all these New Testament apostles and preachers, when the Bible says they preach the word, they preach the Old Testament. So don't think that in the New Testament, we can't preach the Old Testament. Somebody said, well, that's the old. We should be preaching the New Testament. Well, certainly we should be focusing primarily on the New Testament. But the 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 New Testament is built on the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is the only Bible they had back when Jesus was here, when the apostles were here, when the book of Acts was written. They only had one Bible. That's what we call the Old Testament. And so Paul said, listen, I don't consider myself inferior to any of the other apostles, no matter how esteemed they are. But he goes on to say, I was untrained in speech, but not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Verse 7, did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? He said, did I commit a sin because I didn't come in and expect big offerings from you before I served you, laid my life down for you? taught you for countless hours. He said, did I do, did I commit sin? Was I too humble? And sometimes people could misunderstand 
a person's humility and think, well, man, they must not be all that great if they're not charging or if they're not you know, carrying themselves as if they ought to be respected and esteemed at a higher level. Paul said, well, maybe I, maybe I did wrong by coming in with all humility and with uh, free service to bless you. Maybe that misled you. And so he says, verse 8, I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. Now, of course, he doesn't mean that he, you know, at gunpoint or sword point that he robbed people. But he's saying in this regard, if he received offerings from other churches and used those offerings to provide for his needs to travel to get to this city, particularly Corinth, and to preach to them, he's saying, is this the way that it works? That Are you thinking that I robbed other people because I took money from them and came to preach to you free of charge? And he goes on and says, And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you. And so I will keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you. God knows. But what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in all things of which they boast. I'll come back to this. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, and he's calling these false apostles, these these people who come and say they're apostles of God and are preaching the Bible and such, but he's calling them false apostles, and now he calls them Satan's ministers. He says, therefore, uh, it is uh, of no great thing. It is no great thing if his ministers, Satan's ministers, also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. I say again, let no one think me a fool. If otherwise, at least receive me as a fool, that I also may boast a little. What I speak, I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were, foolishly, foolishly in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many boast according to the flesh, I also will boast. For you put up with fools gladly, since you yourselves are wise. For you put up with it if one brings you into bondage, if one devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face. To our shame, I say that we were too weak for that. But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they of the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. Or when he says I speak as a fool, we could say in our uh, day and age, yeah, right. Are they ministers of Christ? Yeah, right. Uh, I, I am more. In labor is more abundant. And then he's going to go into all that he sacrificed. But let me just stop now and put this into perspective. Paul's saying, look, I came to you with such humility as if I'm a nobody. And I didn't charge you a thing. I just served. I taught. I gave my life. In fact, I didn't even charge you. I didn't even ask you to take care of me. But I made tents with my own hands. I I was not a burden. And some of the things that I lacked by not making enough money on my tent making business, other brothers came from Macedonia and supplied my need. In other words, he's saying, I didn't come in like a big wig to make myself known. I came in to love you, to preach to you, to teach you, to help you to understand the truth in the Lord Jesus Christ. And also to be an example of how we should live our lives selflessly to serve other people and to help other people receive the truth. He said, but there are some other apostles that come in and they call themselves apostles, but they really want to be known. They want to be respected, Paul saying, like we are. See, Paul was very respected. And of course, I mean, he was just a jewel of an apostle and the signs of an apostle, uh, the working of miracles were in his ministry. People were healed and delivered and so on. 
and the way he carried himself. Everybody could tell by being around him after a while, he's not trying to make a name for himself. He's really genuinely trying to help people. And the guy knows stuff. I mean, he understands the scriptures like nobody's business. A Pharisee, I mean, he spent his career in his early uh, years, younger adult years, studying, lavishing, I mean, just uh, pouring over the scriptures to learn them. And when his eyes were opened to the Lord Jesus Christ, then he saw Jesus everywhere in the Bible, which we know is the Old Testament. And he said, now you have apostles coming to you and saying, we're an apostle, and they're trying to get the same stature as I, Paul, and his companions. They're trying to get the same esteem, and they're trying to get the same funding, they're trying to uh, have people listen to them, follow their lead and such. And in some cases, some of these apostles were trying to get uh, the Corinthians and others to follow them instead of Paul because they thought, well, he's kind of old school. He's been around a while, but we've got some fresh insight and revelation. He said, look, these people that come in and preach these new gospels, you know, they've got some fresh part of the gospel that is not what I laid down to you. And uh, he said, and people that come in and they're, they're preaching Jesus in a way that was not preached to you before. He said, you know, you have to understand that even Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. So we should not be surprised when human beings come in as if they're apostles of Christ, but they're not. They're not really apostles. And so then he begins to defend himself and say, look, look, they, they might say, well, we're of the seed of Abraham. He said, so am I. So he went through this whole list of criteria that they are presenting that makes them apostles. And Paul said, I got all those. Paul said, besides all of those things, being an apostle, being of the seed of Abraham, uh, uh, having the time in the ministry and so on, being a minister, a servant of Christ. And he said, I've got the whole list that they say is the criteria. He said, I meet all those criteria. But then Paul's going to go into something now that is really powerful. He said, let me tell you what else I have that few, if any of them have. Listen to what he said. He said, verse 23, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. Yeah, right. I am more in labors more abundant. What does that mean? I work harder than all of them. I work more hours than all of them for this apostleship. He said, they don't work as hard. He said, in labor is more abundant. In stripes above measure. He said, you can't even measure how many times I've been beaten with stripes and I still keep going. He said, have they done that? He goes on to say, in prisons more frequently. I've been thrown, arrested and thrown into prison for preaching the gospel more than any of them have. In an interesting list of criteria, wouldn't you say? In deaths, often. In other words, I've been beaten to the point of death. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. That was the maximum amount that uh, Jews could be given. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned and, of course, left for dead. And, and it seems that he may have even been dead. And then God raised him from the dead. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. I mean, how many people could be shipwrecked three times in their life? A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeys, often, he said, I travel so much tirelessly in perils of water or like dangers of water in perils of robbers in perils of my own countrymen the jews in perils of the gentiles in perils in the city in perils in the wilderness in perils in the sea in perils among false brethren in weakness and toil in sleeplessness often in hunger and thirst in fasting often in cold and nakedness and you can you would think well man paul like this makes you an apostle? Paul said, yes, because no matter what's thrown at me, whether it be from human beings or from Satan and the demonic realm, he said, I don't stop. I keep doing my ministry. He said, do those other apostles do that? Do they do that? Do they keep uh, going forward and saying, but I've got to get the gospel to another city. I've got to go back to that city and strengthen them and disciple them and such. Paul said, this is what makes you a true minister of the Lord. It's not how esteemed you think you should be, but how much are you willing to suffer? How much pain are you willing to endure to minister to people, to love people, to bless people? 
See, this is just a precious chapter here, and it shows Paul's heart, and it shows the reality of what being a minister of the gospel is all about. So he said in verse 28, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. That word concern is uh, marimna. It's, it's a word that means worry. He said, besides all these things that happen to me on the outside, these persecutions, he said, man, I've got this worry inside of me for the churches because I'm concerned about them. You know, it's not like in our day where you can just call them on the phone or text them or email them or communicate very quickly. No, you, you had to send a courier, so to speak. You had to travel to a place. So you really don't know what's happening. And, and he said, I would have this worry come on me that would tell me that, oh, man, they probably fell away from the Lord. They probably got taken advantage of by some person preaching a heresy or some deception. And maybe they're not serving the Lord anymore. And he's concerned about him because he doesn't want him to go to hell. He doesn't want him to be lost. See, and so he said, all those things come, but then this worry over all of you, not just in Corinth, but all the churches everywhere, this worry comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? You wouldn't think this would be a boast, but Paul is saying, yeah, you're going through problems? Well, what about me? I'm going, I go through more problems and uh, has gone through. I tell you, when I read this list every time, I think, how could one person go through this much? Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity or my weakness. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, was guarding the city of Damascus with a garrison, and a, or of the Damascenes with a garrison, desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hand. So he's still going on and explaining just a little further, and you don't want to miss chapter 12, because in chapter 12, he explains something that's very famous called Paul's thorn in the flesh. And I want you to see it maybe in a different light than you've ever seen it before.